Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to our uh, third webinar in the series. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, so this evening we have uh, an interview with the, uh, a presentation from Eric uh, Eric Helland. Uh, I'll introduce him in a, in a couple of, in a couple of moments. So before we get started, uh, on your question box, uh, feel free to, to fire in some questions as we move along. Um, if I can work them in as we talk, we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll keep them for the end and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll ask the questions then. Um, on the line with me now, we have uh, Peter, uh, Peter Larkin, the CEO of Metrofit. Peter, hello. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar. And we have with us uh, Eric Helland. Um, Eric is the Director of Strength and Conditioning at the University of Wisconsin and the Men's Basketball Strength and Conditioning Coach and he has a very, very impressive background in Strength and Conditioning Coaching. Um, Eric, very welcome. How are you? Thank you very much. Good to be here. Great to have you. So listen, Eric, maybe you might, uh, rather me uh, talk, talking about your, your, your profile, maybe you might just introduce uh, where you've come from and how you've, how you've come to be where you are now. Yep. Well, I started when I was in college. I mean, I enjoyed training for sports as I was in high school. When I moved into into the co into, into college for my undergraduate uh, degree, uh, I loved the weight room. And so, as I began my education, um, you know, I had some professors that uh, I would have classes that I would write, you know, papers and things of that nature on really training related issues. Uh, I had two of my coaches, two of my uh, professors at that level. At that point, asked if I was interested in in working with some of their teams. At that point, I was 20 years old. Uh, at that point, I started working with some of the teams at University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, which is a Division three school, a smaller college here in Wisconsin. Um, I got my start there. After that, I went to a high school for one year, um, started a strength and conditioning program there, uh, made part of the curriculum, did it for athletes, did it for students. Um, when I left school then, uh, again, my, my path was pretty well determined. Um, I, long story short, I ended up um, volunteering time for Al Vermeil. And Al Vermeil had been with the 49ers, San Francisco 49ers, the NFL, for a few years and now it was in Chicago with the Chicago Bulls. Um, at that point I was just looking for an opportunity to learn. Um, I saw in him an experienced uh, coach, a very well thought of coach. And I was just really looking for that opportunity to learn. So he was kind enough to take me on, and, and that relationship started in 19, really 1987, um, and was there through, you know, 2001, really. Um, so like I said, Al was a, an amazing mentor for me. Uh, we worked together at the Chicago Bulls throughout the 90s. Um, after that, when Al stepped back, I became the head strength and conditioning coach for 13, 12, 13 years. And, then I find myself here at the University of Wisconsin. So, you know, I spent 25 years in the NBA, um, which is a phenomenal uh, experience, amazing people. Uh, like I said, it's kind of a storybook kind of a thing. It really, really was fantastic. Yeah. A few years ago, they gave me a call from the University of Wisconsin. They had an opening um, and asked if I would be interested in this. And I, I kind of jumped at it. I, I'm a native of Wisconsin. I grew up 30 minutes south of here. I've got family. I've got friends in the area. Um, you know, more importantly, the the environment is different. The NBA, I always felt like I was. What you really do is control and direct the chaos because more. everything is changing all the time. You're always constantly on the move. Um, really, the the hard thing is to, like I said, is make that chaos meaningful in some way. At the university here, the difference is is we're in a very stable environment. We have, you know, the kids have to go to school. They have, you know, obviously their athletic, you know, their athletics. They're training with me, all that kind of stuff. And uh, like I said, it's a very stable environment, you know, for the coaches, for the players. And uh, you know, like I said, it's much different than the NBA, the NBA in that regard. Plus, I get to spend so much more time with my family, which is a big, sure. big issue for me. Yeah, I, I, look, 25 years with the Chicago Bulls. I mean, one of the best known sports franchises on the planet, you would have worked with some of the best athletes in the world. I mean, bringing that, uh, that 25 years of experience and, and bringing that into, into the University of Wisconsin, um, you must have 
a lot to be able to pass on to young basketball players and then young athletes in general actually having learned from from some of the best pros in the world. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I, I think any any great coaches, the coaches are out here listening to that now. I think they would agree that it's really it's the kind of you know the experiences the experiences that you have. Um, oh God, I I don't know how to explain it. I, it's it's I guess the people you come in contact with, the the things you experience as you move on, that becomes just something. There are things you can draw back on. So when something occurs, let's say now, um, again, you can relate it back to something that happened in the past. Most coaches, I think, they be, they're, they're great observers of human behavior. And that's kind yeah. of what I want to get to. And, and th that's just it. Is I, I, I've always been fortunate to be around really amazing people, amazing coach, coaches, amazing athletes. And you, you, know, you draw experience from watching them work, having conversations with them. Um, see them go through difficult periods, how they solve problems, how they work on a daily basis, what kind of habits do they have. And, you know, those habits I try to, I, I try to embrace myself and how I approach my profession, but I also try to impart those habits, um, you know, those things, those values we have to have uh, to our athletes, which is interesting because, again, it's, when you talk about strength and conditioning, I think a lot of people talk about you know the the exercises you do, or what kind of program do you run, or you know this and that, and and it's certainly very very important. But I think how you relate to your athletes, how you send that message, um, can you drive the process forward uh, between their ears is such a huge issue. Yeah, I, look, I mean, we we know that 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 being a good athlete, and being a, becoming a great athlete, is about the habits you keep, and you mentioned habits there, um, and. I suppose a key part of that, and for a coach in terms of helping an athlete to develop those habits, they've got to have a very strong relationship. But as you said, it's about observing the behavior and understanding human nature. But have you found that? Absolutely. And and I, I think if you look back, if you start to think in that context, and you look at coaches that are successful, you look at players that are successful, they are very good at that human at that human aspect of that. I mean, Phil Jackson was a very, obviously, an outstanding technical coach, but yep. more importantly, he was able to take big personalities, big egos, and kind of get everybody pulling the same direction. So, again, understanding what the expectation is, the, you know, the players understanding, you know, why we're doing it this way, um, and getting that gr a group kind of polarized and pulling in the same direction is, is quite a gift. And, you know, you see in the NBA all the time, in all sports, I think, where you know when you have a strong philosophical and value system that supports it, you can sustain excellence. I mean, you know, you look at the New England Patriots or you look at uh, the San Antonio Spurs, who've had a lot of continuity over the years, but they're very principled organizations. You know what I mean? And like I said, yeah. what they do, they tend to bring people in, maybe not the greatest athletes, but they certainly fit the system particularly well. Um, they they are very professional in their approach. They tend to get better on a year on a year by year basis. But you know, like I said, I think it's um, in professional sports. There's always the temptation for the quick fix. Well, how are we going to fix the organization? Well, let's just let's get this free agent. And the problem is, it's very much of a quick and it's a very one dimensional fix. If underlying it, you're not principled. Um, you know, then I think that it's just it's kind of doomed to failure. Or you just can't sustain. You can't sustain the success. Of course, yeah. And, no, and, and obviously, you know, you, you can you can hire a free agent, but if they're if they're not a good cultural fit into your philosophical setup, that's not going to work very well as a as a quick fix. Obviously, I like, I like that word, the culture. And the thing is, if I look, when you look at a great player, in my opinion, a great player elevates the level of play of everybody around him. That includes Agreed. management. That includes the coaching staff. Everybody involved. That person is someone who is, you know, brings people along for the ride. And like I said, I think you see this in sports. You know, there's people in every sport that you go, and this guy's a phenomenal player, but his teams don't succeed. And yeah. maybe there's a level of selfishness there that is disruptive in that way. You know, it, it, it. You know, that person can become the anti-hero. That as talented as he is, as many physical, as many things he can do on the court or on the pitch or anywhere, that 
you know, they do they really contribute to to positive outcomes? So, you know, to me, you know, greatness is something that is sustainable because it's real, um, it's principle, and you know, like I said, it's there, there's an unselfishness to it. There really is, and I gotta think Michael Jordan's probably the perfect example of it. When Phil Jackson came on board, before that, this the, our Bulls team was very much just Michael Jordan and then eleven other guys. And yeah. Phil really convinced him that for him to be successful, he had to involve the other, the other, the other, the other players, and he had to develop a level of trust, which I think we did to a real high degree. But to see that process, you know, you talk about being around something that has an impact on you as a coach. It, it's remarkable. I mean, so when I speak to my players now, I'm this is not me something I read in the book. It's something I witnessed firsthand at the highest level. So yeah. I, I do get a good response from our athletes, um, and I think it's a fairly simple process. I mean, there's there's got to be a selflessness to this whole thing. I, I don't think it's any different than a than a company or anything else, any other endeavor. Um, you know, you have to have a good cast of people pulling the same direction. Yeah, of course. And look, you're 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 at Wisconsin now for uh, is this the end of your third season? Yes, sir. Yep, just so, finished my uh, season. How how has it been going? I love it. So my my first two years, um, we went to the final four. The first year we lost in the semifinals. The year after that, we lost in the uh, national finals for the national championship. Um, but like I said, I I'm happy to say that you know, like I said, the coaching staffs, the university, the players. They're, they're, we have wonderful people here. That, that's that's the most important thing. You know, when you look at uh, our athletic director Barry Alvarez, to our whole administrative staff, uh, to the coaching staff that's here. Initially, it was Bo Ryan. Now we have Greg Gard. All of the assistant coaches we have on board, the type of kids that we recruit to this university, um, we're a little bit different model. We don't typically recruit, you know, the big four-star, five-star, high-level recruits. You know, we kind of we're sort of a system oriented, kind of like the San Antonio Spurs. You know, our feeling is that what we get is a very intelligent athlete, one that understands how to play within the context of a system. And you know, we really feel like with the resources available to us, um, our guys get better on a continuous basis. We're always moving forward. Um, again, it's 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 a very healthy, uh, I think, very repeatable model. And last year. Uh, we made it to the Sweet 16 um, in the NCAA tournament, which is a terrific accomplishment with really a very inexperienced group. We only had two of those players on last year's teams had played the year before. That's so really, everybody else was brand new. But I think that speaks to our development of our athletes, um, that you know the, the, the guy is not as involved. You know, the underclassmen, the younger guys, they're developing physically, they're developing mentally, emotionally, um, they're understanding the game. When their time comes, they're, they're prepared. Um, and so I think it smooths that transition. But again, it goes back to being you know, a very you know, principle-driven uh, type of a situation. Yeah. And, and you've been using Metrofit. I know we're going to talk about this uh, you know, as, we, as we move along. But you've been using Metrofit there for a couple of seasons now. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so, why? What? 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 What drove you to, to look for a, for a monitoring solution? Well, it's uh, my feeling is 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 I I monitor anything that I value. I like to monitor, and so I'm I'm glad this is kind of progressing the way it is. You know, we go back to habits. We talk about habits all the time. We talk about our habits in the in the training environment. Talk about tra habits on the practice floor. Habits in games personal habits, you know, what are we doing outside of this environment? Are we taking good care of ourselves? Are we eating properly? Are we sleeping properly? If we're overstressed, are we doing things, are we employing recovery modalities to help assist in that process? So it's something that I feel like we are always doing something positive. And yeah. I teach our athletes that what we do is we what we do is manage fatigue. When we feel good, we overreach. When we have overreached and we're overwrought, then we do something to recover. But it's not a passive, it's a very aggressively, um, um, you're constantly being, you're constantly connected. Um, you know, again, it's not a passive, um, a passive undertaking. Um, and how, how, have, how have your athletes taken to it? 
brilliantly. I, I think it's wonderful. And it's, you know what, the big, uh, to me the biggest, a couple of the bigger components to it is the educational aspect. So yeah. if, I'm, if I'm monitoring um, using the RPEs, obviously, I'm looking at player loads, I'm looking at strain, I'm looking at monotony, I'm looking at their, at their readiness uh, information they're kicking, that they're kicking back to me. So when an athlete doesn't have good habits, so they're not sleeping well, they're not eating well, whatever the case may be, I can start to relate that back to these fatigue numbers. I can also, I'll do things like, I'll do uh, RSI, reactive strength index, um, sometimes we'll use uh, some other uh, other means for for, for monitoring the, the acute condition of our athletes, but I, I think it's it's uh, this gives us a, a foundation to understand really what the athlete is experiencing. And yeah. like I said, I, it's interesting because we'll talk a little bit more about other means of monitoring our athletes. Um, but I, I the, really the the RPE is kind of brilliantly simple. I feel. So I, I love that metric. I love that. I love it. Um, and like I said, the MetroFit has been amazing for us. Again, just to kind of account for some of these habits and how they're affecting our our athletes. Okay, cool. So I'll just flip on the slide there. So here, here's what we're going to talk about today, uh, Eric. Maybe you could take us through those four points briefly. Yeah. Well, my background, we just kind of went through that. I mean, I, yep. again, I think it's, you know, the, the training, the, the experience and learnings aspect of it is, you know, my feeling is my advantage, if I have any advantage, is I've always tried to associate myself with just really outstanding individuals. And it started with my work with Al Vermeil in the 80s. And uh, again, a, a phenomenal, a phenomenal coach and a phenomenal human being, a coach's coach, very technical, technically oriented, but really very much grounded in, you know, the, the coaching aspect of this. And so, like I said, being around him, I, I, I would not be where I am now. I would not be speaking to you guys today if it weren't for Alvin Neal. So I'm, I'm very appreciative. I'm very humbled by, you know, that experience. Um, you know, throughout the years we've had, you know, contact with amazing coaches from around the world, sports scientists, coaches from other sports track and field, Olympic weightlifting, the sports sciences, etc. So, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, when you, I guess when you associate with those type of people, when you're kind of running in those circles, you pick up some very, very good, some very good concepts. So, undoubtedly, yeah. in my experiences and background. So, um, the key components to an official strength program is its relevance. Uh, Honestly, I'm going to distill it down to something very simple. Is what you do in the training environment relevant to what they have to do in whatever their sport is? I think sometimes in the U.S. a little bit, I think we can be, I, I want to compliment Europe and, and Australia and some of the other parts of our world. Um, we're a little, they're a little bit less, I think, influenced by commercial ventures. Um, mm -hmm. you know, everything in the U.S. we had kind of a trending in the last you know, 10 or 15 years of kind of incorporating a, uh, a sports medicine or a rehabilitation model to, to training athletes. And it's something that kind of pervaded in the NBA for a while. We looked at everybody as being broken, which I don't, okay. believe, that, I don't believe that to be the case. I think if you look at what we ask our athletes to do on the court, they experience high loads, high forces. They're very athletic. They're very. It's a very uncontrolled ballistic environment. So if you look at what I do in training, you know we do everything in terms of strength development. I'm going to put them on their feet. They're going to squat. They're going to pull. They're going to press. If we're going to increase power, we're going to use plyometrics. We're going to do all kinds of different jumping, depending on the motor quality we want to affect. We're doing Olympic weightlifting and its variations. Um, we're working on speed development. We're working on lateral speed and agility. We're looking at the motor efficiency of that. We're looking at the metabolic efficiency of that. Um, so I don't think there's any real mysteries. I think for the practitioners out there who are listening to this podcast right now, I think you know what I'm talking about. Again, you look at guys who write programs, and it's a pretty program, but do they achieve good outcomes? Are they, are they really a sound program? And I think no matter what the vocation is, everything we do Real genius resides in the ability to really root everything in fundamentals. Whether it's track and field, Olympic weightlifting, soccer, basketball, football, you name it. The teams that do things well, that tend to progress over time, are so ridiculously good at the fundamentals, it's not even right. 
Yeah. And I, I, I think if anybody were in my training environment, I think they would understand that. I think there's relatively simple tools we use that everybody uses. Um, I do think what we try to do is draw out a lot of the of the nuances. I think we adapt the training modalities to the athlete in particular very well. I look at my contact with them is very educational based, more from a more is as much from a a psychological uh, perspective or a or a cognitive perspective as much as a uh, motor perspective. You know, it's really what I'm doing is expanding on their motor vocabulary and yeah. their motor and their motor capacity. So, you know, like I said, I, I when you walk in our weight room, it's we're training athletes. I'm not training bodybuilders. I'm not training power lifters. Um, everybody's got different potential in the different lifts, so I don't necessarily put a number and say, you know, listen, if you squat 150 kilos, that's good. If you only squat 100 kilos, that's bad. Um, my, I've got a kid who's a seven foot one, uh, 220 pound uh, Belgian, it's and a big kid. it's a very thin kid. He was, he was, he was 90 kilos when he walked in the door. Wow. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, like I said, I mean, do I impose that kind of a, uh, of a expectation on him? You know, he squats almost 100 kilos now, and I, I come from where he came from a year ago, it's brilliant. So I'm very, very pleased about that. But, you know, like I said, I, 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 I evaluate the individual, not necessarily try to impose a single metric or a single expectation on a, a, an entire group. Okay, so I, so then um, athlete and coach education communication you you, you want to talk about briefly we we we'll come to that slide shortly as well. But what's the what's the basis there? That's that's everything. I mean, it's everything we do. So, like I said, I guess you know the athletes now they want to know what to do, how to do it, and why we do it this way. And so the athletes a bit more inquisitive than it was when I was a young man, where we just kind of shut our mouth and went forward. Um, now, you know, the, the athletes like to know. I have very, very, very smart kids in my environment, and I can explain concepts to them, and they pick it up re really very readily. And it helps with their understanding and with their kind of buy into what we're trying to do. So education takes place on a number of different levels. It takes place as far as, as you know, we talked about these habits. So if I explain these habits, what we should be doing, evaluate where they're at, give them a prescription or give them a bit of a guide, give them a bit of the guideline, and then I monitor it, that communication and that education format is brilliant because now what I'm doing, I'm not just a talking box. I'm speaking directly to what their situation is. So I may have a kid who sleeps great. Well, you, does that kid need a 20-minute lecture on sleep health? Probably sure. not. But I may have three or four kids like that who I'll pull aside and then we'll do some sleep education stuff, some sleep monitoring things. But I wouldn't know that if I wasn't if I wasn't collecting the data. So we'll go back to the Metrofit a little bit. So I understand their behaviors. They're reporting them back to me. I can associate them with outcomes. And then as we make improvement, they can feel and they can see improvement in these other in these other areas. So as a means of communication, it's brilliant. And that's the way I use you know the Metrofit right now is is really a communication hub, a way to collect information and communicate to and with my athletes. Um, like I said, even non-compliance I really enjoy. So yeah. if I get a kid who's non-compliant, do I get upset at him? I don't get upset at him in, in the least. What it tells me is what his commitment level is um, and what his level of function is. So sure, and I'll yeah. guarantee you, if he's non, if he's if he is non-committal or he's non, he, he's not really a, part, a participant using the Metrofit. Chances are he's not organizing his time particularly well with academics and everything else. So now you kind of use this as a again, it's now it's a it's an entry point for me in conversation of are you really taking care of everything a, everything around you? Sure, so, and, and 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 that leads. Obviously, straight into then embracing the technology because you know what we're talking about here is is a piece yeah. of technology that helps you gather that information. And and we had Bill Besman last week, um, uh, formerly of Under Armour, and he was talking about embracing technology as well. But part of that discussion was that kids now are so much more advanced technologically than you, you or I were, <laughs> you, you know, uh, twenty years ago or whatever. Yeah. 
um, yep. it, it helps, and we're speaking to them in their language. Absolutely, couldn't I could not agree with you guys more. It's it's a it's a video. It's interesting. It's a it's really a video game generation. Yeah. They're very much into graphics. They like to see things. They're very visual. They're more visual probably, like I said, than my generation was. Who tended to be a little bit more verbal, obviously. Um, but I think it's um, again, this is the same. It's the same medium. You know, as an example, we also use Jimaware. And the Jimaware is, again, a laptop-based thing. We used it to b measure bar velocities. We'll do some jump testing with it. But it's right there on the platform. It's right there in the rack. They can see their bar speeds. They can see their outcomes. It, they get that immediate feedback. We can keep track of their, of their outcomes. We can keep track of, of uh, how their workouts go and things of that nature. We can make comparisons. We can compete with one another. But it's another example of using a technology to really drive the training process, to drive the training process forward. Um, to me, my, my feeling about technology is we don't employ technology for technology's sake. We, take, we employ technology that improves our outcomes. Yeah, it must be like outcome driven. Yeah. You know, we all kind of work on the edge a little bit at times when we integrate new concepts. Um, but like I said, to me, you know, I'm not going to be that speculative if it, distracts me from my main task, which is the interaction with the athlete. But you know, something like the Metrofit or the Gym Aware or some of the other measuring things we use are very helpful because again, I can use them as a means to educate the athletes, monitor the athletes' you know, response to different stressors, um, and allows me to make better decisions. So again, if I'm if I'm collecting, you know, a a metric that's not really helping me, I have, I'll abandon it. You know, I keep what's valuable and I get rid of everything else. Just before we move on to the next piece, I, there's a question here from, from Joseph. Uh, he wants to know, what is the best way to monitor how much stronger a player has gotten? Well, I, you know, I really like, I, you can use raw numbers, obviously. Um, yeah. so again, you can, you can set norms. My feeling is that you set norms in basketball in particular. I, I have a tendency not to set norms. For in for whole teams or anything like that, I've got a five I've got a five foot ten point guard and I've got a seven foot one Belgian. That's a big I, difference. I, I can't compare the two. They're two different species, two different body types, two different nervous systems, two completely different things. I think that in terms of testing for strength, certainly leg strength, I value the squat. You know what I mean? As 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 a as a measure, um, I look at training every time our guys go in the weight room. That is an, I'm evaluating that. I see how they're tolerating loads. I see the bar velocities they're moving those loads at, and you see that progression over time. Over time, I think with different sports, as I talk to football coaches, etc., I think because they have a more, I said, homogeneous, I guess, um, yep. a group of athletes. Like I can compare all of my offensive linemen for the most part, or all of my defensive linemen or all of my linebackers, tight ends, and fullbacks. So you can group them a little bit more because they're all of the same body mass. Relative height is the same. Relative age is the same. So I think it's a little easier in certain sports. Maybe soccer would be much easier where the athletes tend to be more similar in size to establish, uh, to establish your norms. Um, so, but again, that's something that is very sports specific. I think it's very athlete specific. Um, does that answer the question? I, I, I certainly hope so. And uh, yeah. if not, Joseph, Joseph will let us know. I'm sure. Uh, just, a, just a quick, a quick. Uh, yeah, he says yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, so, just, just to kind of take that, take that, uh, uh, just another step. Uh, how can, how, how does the the output from from Metrifit help you in terms of um, athlete strength, but and, and then translating that into athlete performance? Well, what we look at is I want to see how the athlete's responding. So again, there's times when we overreach and I induce fatigue, obviously. That's how our athletes adapt. Okay, we apply a stressor with a certain, you know, motor quality or whatever that we want, uh, we want to affect. So you're applying stress to the athlete. So obviously, temporarily, they're impaired. So you want to see that predictable response. So if I'm looking at Metrofit, I'm looking at RTTs and, and, and seeing you know, what their fatigue level is, what their mood state is. By the way, I love mood state. Uh, I think it's reflective of kind of neurological status. 
Um, when guys are overwrought, when they're overworked, then mood state really deteriorates quickly. And I think it's probably, it may be, in my opinion, you know, the most uh, reliable and the, and the uh, quickest thing to go, I think, uh, when your athletes are overworked. Um, but like I said, I use it to monitor fatigue. You know, again, what, what, I, what I teach our athletes is, again, is we are constantly monitoring fatigue. We're, we're balancing fatigue. When we are over fatigued, then we need to facilitate the recovery process. So we back off on loading and we increase, you know, recovery modalities. When we feel good, which we try to structure into the training model, um, we overreach. Um, okay. So like I said, it's, you're controlling the process. And so I may get an athlete, it, here's a really good scenario, I may get an athlete that I think should be fully recovered, but perhaps his girlfriend broke up with him the night before and he slept three hours and did not eat breakfast. He comes yeah. in that day, predictably, the rest of his teammates are in a very good, in a very good situation, ready to train, you know, very fresh, very ready to go. He walks in and he looks literally like he's just death warmed over. And yeah. you know now I can because I see that, I see his body language, I see that in his MetroFit score. Um, that's the kind of kid that I just don't throw him into the general population. I'll pull him out, see how he's doing. I will reduce the workload for that day. By the same token, and for all you coaches out there, you understand this, is you plan a recovery day, for instance, or you think your guy should be really tired for some inexplicable reason the kid is throwing weight around like he's like coach I, I don't feel the bar in my hand I don't feel the bar on my back you know he's jumping out of the gym and you go wow how what happened well, we don't really know I guess the point being is that what I'm looking for is opportunities to overreach so if your athlete for some reason is functioning at a very high level I need to take advantage of that so and it's interesting a long time ago I I was trying to figure out a lot of the Russian literature and a lot of the uh, Russian training logs and things like that, and and I I, I was looking at particularly particular Russian weightlifters um, material, and I couldn't figure out kind of the sequencing of things. Like, how did they load? I mean, it seemed very random to me. So I talked to a gentleman who was more familiar with material, and he said, "Well, that's not the training plan you're looking at. That's the training log." I said, well, what's the difference? He said, well, the plan is your starting point. You know what I mean? It's your ideal. He said, but the training doesn't survive contact with the athlete. And so, like I said, there are days when they may have walked in and planned high loads, but the athlete wasn't receptive. So it became a bit more of a recovery day. So they'd modify. There'd be days they walk in, conversely, where they planned a recovery day, and the, the, the athlete was amazing. So really, you're adapting to the acute condition of the athlete. So, you know, by monitoring, using MetroFit, using GymAware, you know, using force plates, you know, we, we try to find those, those moments, and we try to take advantage of those. So uh, just another question, and it seems like a good question uh, from Marcus. He, he wants to know, what kind of recovery, to, recovery tools do you have available when athletes are overreaching? Yeah, so you know, obviously we use a nutritional intervention and sleep as the basis for really everything we do. You know, there's kind of the cornerstones of what you do. Besides that, you know, again, we're we're considering the soft tissue component. So we're doing massage therapy. We have physiotherapists. We have um, we use foam rolls. I'll we'll do additional stretching, um, lacrosse balls, any form of soft tissue. Um, therapy, whether self-applied or using a professional, um, we'll use those type of things. One thing I really love is the Normatex, um, you know, the um, dynamic um, um, compression devices, the sleeves they pull over their legs, um, amazing, really, really, really wonderful modality. Um, we've had a ton of success with that. Um, it's interesting because, you know, as compared to let's say massage or even hydrotherapy, hot cold or cold baths or hot baths or whatever you want to do, um, they don't seem to adapt to it in the same way and get kind of a muted effect. Um, I think just the fact that what you're doing is increasing peripheral circulation with the compression um, really speeds the healing process. And I tend to use it more in season. Um, I guess I'm a little concerned off season. I, I, 
I like the soreness. I like the stiffness because I think it kind of helps to drive the, adi the adaptation response. But in season is a different thing. I need these guys to be able to train and freshen up and perform. So we use a ton of it in the off season. I mean, in the in season. I'm sorry, um, because yeah. I need my guys functioning at a high level during games. Um, we use that. So what we use is I'll use the dynamic compression periodically. Um, in between, uh, we use static compression. So we've used uh, the the uh, two uh, was it two X U shit uh, EC three D product, the static compression for the lower for the lower, for the lower body. Um, so we, we we do that kind of thing as well. So our guys, you use the compression garments kind of in the in the midterm, you know, they can wear it to class, they can wear it on the bus after games, um, you name it. It's it's nice in that way. So, and then I carry the the Normatec with us. Um, you know, we use massage sticks, um, things of that nature. So, okay, that's a fairly comprehensive answer. So, Marcus, I hope you you got something good from that. Um, so. Okay, let's let's talk talk briefly about this slide we, we have up here. So, how has strength training evolved? The scientific basis, the balancing models and methods, and the testing involved. Um, yeah. so what what's been your what's been your experience? Yeah. Well, 25 years ago, everything was more based on the really kind of the strength or the iron sports. So it came out of track and field. It came out of Olympic weightlifting, um, bodybuilding. Unfortunately, some of it came out of bodybuilding. Um, but over the, I think over the years, as science began to assert more and more influence on the training, especially in the, especially in the U.S., um, we started to look at, you know, the means that we use and really is there scientific basis behind it. Um, I think science usually confirms what the practitioner already knows, um, and I think that's kind of interesting. I think as strength and conditioning coaches, um, you know, we we're try, we're we're trying different methods. And it's kind of a hit or miss type of thing. Typically, science comes in and backfills and basically confirms, I think, what certain practitioners have already known, that I'm getting good result from this. I'm just not exactly sure really why that's happening. Um, I think that answers the why. And it helps you, again, make better decisions and kind of drives your evolution as, as a strength and conditioning coach. So again, it, it asks the relevant questions. Um, Again, it clarifies, it clarifies things, it helps you connect data points, it helps you ask better questions. Um, it's, you know, again, the science is instrumental to driving, you know, our evolution forward as, as practitioners. Um, you know, like I said, so it's, as we progress, you know, forward, um, again, technology comes more and more into, into the equation, which we really didn't have 25 years ago. So monitoring fatigue, monitoring outputs, um, monitoring behaviors, you know, it's literally 15 years ago we weren't doing this. You know, we had some jump mats, a few couple people had force plates, but, you know, we didn't have, you know, uh, didn't have GPS units, we didn't have accelerometers, we didn't have heart rate monitors, we're kind of there, but they weren't using a ton of them 20 years ago. Um, so like I said, we've got a lot more tools at our disposal, so, um, so it's interesting. They, I think you know, I, I, I kind of touched on it momentarily. In the U.S., I think we have had a, a devolution at times. Again, when you have, I think certain influences come into the, uh, into the profession. Again, you kind of have this, again, sports medicine model of everybody's hurt. So really, all we're going to do is movement-based stuff. Um, you know, there's not going to be any load present. We don't work at velocities that are relevant to our sport. Um, we don't do a good job of evaluation, whatever the case may be. Um, I think that's been, we have ebbs and flows, I think, in certain areas, um, but I think we're getting really beyond that. Okay, so I, and it is moving along. I mean, the, the rate of, the rate of, of evolution in, in terms of straight strength training, training this, the, the science behind it, and the technology that's supporting that, it is, it's, it's pretty head spinning. Yeah, it's going very quickly, and it's here we got it. When you get to the front edge of that, that's where we start to get into a little bit of a gray area. I think, um, you know, some of the numbers I think that we're getting from um, 
some of the technology, I don't think we know really what it means for specific sports. I think some sports are using, for instance, the GPS technologies in you know soccer and things like that. But they're really they're able to look at at distances and speeds, uh, which is very valuable. I think when you look at you know some of the accelerometer data and some of that data in the game of basketball, we don't know what these numbers mean. It's it's not. You know, we're getting a lot of numbers, but everybody's got individual thresholds. Like I said, the individuality in the game of basketball is very, very broad. So it's difficult to compare one athlete to a next. What's the threshold load for one athlete? Maybe a sub, you know, really a sub-threshold, significantly sub-threshold load for a different athlete. So again, you know, establish what these numbers mean. Again, are they helping us make better decisions? Are they and are they improving our outcomes is pretty important. I like kind of the idea of working on the edge, but I can never let it become detrimental to our outcomes. I can't let it be, sure, yeah. I can't let it be a distraction. Of course, of course, yeah. So, you know, if, if we if we just move on and talk about the key components then of, of an efficient strength training program, and, and maybe, you know, how how monitoring can help that. I mean, you, you know, you've talked quite a bit about um, about customizing programs for for athlete depending on body type and, 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 and their individual potential. Um, yep. So, so what, what's, what's really important then in terms of doing that? Yes. Evaluation is, is absolutely, absolutely critical at the starting, at the start of the, the uh, at the start of this, at the start of this. What we do is we have to understand what our athletes present level of function is. Do they have movement impairments? Do they have uh, residual effects from prior injuries? Those kind of things. We need to have that information. So I go through kind of a whole sequence, if you will. Um, I start really with a structural evaluation. I take a look at the athlete from three different angles. Really, I'm only looking at posture and alignment. I wanted to look at how they stand, how their joints align, you know, what characteristics are they bringing, what their proportions look like. So I'm making an evaluation based on that. The next thing I look at is spinal motion in forward flexion, rotation, lateral bend, lateral bending, and extension. So I see how the spine moves. In basketball, our athletes have very long spines. Um, I'm going to have to load that spine. The spine is certainly going to be loaded during the game. Um, I want to see how they're tolerating that load. Before I start to apply load, I want to understand how they're going to respond to it, or at least have an idea how they may respond to it. So. And it helps drive my programming initially. Then I'll take them through. I'll put them on a table and I'll go joint by joint and look at ranges of motion. A lot of it through the hip, a lot of it through the ankle are big, 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 for, uh, big ones for basketball. You know, an athlete who moves well through the hips and ankles is usually a very efficient and a very healthy athlete. When you see impairments there, typically it'll focus stress in other areas, and we and we tend to have breakdowns. So we tend to, we'll look at that. So at this point, everything is very non-functional in nature. Then I'll take them through really what's a is a modified um, Gray Cook functional movement screen. I've retained probably 60% of his move, movement screen. I like the idea of grading it the way he does. Um, I've modified some of the exercises to fit my needs, I think, a little bit better. Um, and frankly, every time I've missed something in a screen, what I'll do is I'll add that to the uh, test protocols. Um, so I'll, uh, I've kind of modified that for my to suit my own, to suit my own needs. And then last, and we'll go through you know the typical great cook overhead squat, lunge pattern, you know jumping onto a leg, landing onto a leg. I'll do a step down test. I try to look at kind of global, uh, you know athlete, you know stiffness, you know uh, uh, core strength, if you will, um, in a very simple fashion. Uh, then we move on to the athletic testing. So we'll use kind of Carmelo Bosco's protocols of evaluating a, a vertical jump. So we'll do a series of static vertical jumps, a series of counter movement vertical jumps, and we'll do repeat vertical jumps. And then at the end of it, I'll let them do, for the basketball player's sake, a maximum vertical jump with a step. Um, I'm looking at those ratios. Um, I can determine certain things by the ratios I see. Um, it helps me kind of evaluate where the athlete is as far as force production and the different characteristics we're looking at. Then I watch them, uh, we sprint, do a 20-meter sprint, a self-start, 
and then we do basically a, a, a lateral change of direction test, which is nothing more than a short shuttle, an electronic short shuttle. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm, I am uh, videotaping all of this, so I'm looking at, okay, if I've made certain assertions with the earlier portions of the evaluation, is this proven to be true dynamically? Are these, are these deficiencies uh, manifesting themselves in performance? And interestingly, sometimes you look at it and go, oh, he's not very good at this. He gets on the floor, and I think most of you know, the, the, the coaches out there would agree, some of our best athletes are just phenomenal um, at, at coping. They have great coping mechanism. Um, so like I said, they develop strategies um, around this, and sometimes they're very successful at it. Okay, so, fantastic. And at well, what point? Uh, you know, again, progress. Now, you know, it, the evaluation allows you to insert the person, the athlete, into the, into the training at the appropriate level. Um, you know, again, we're starting with general, you know, GPP, uh, you know, general, you know, physical qualities that we are, you know, we're training the athletes to train. You know, are they a balanced athlete? Do they have good mobility, good joint stability? Do they have good, good postural stability dynamically and under, and under load? Um, if we can increase their capacity to work and tolerate work um, before we ever really start to load them extensively. Do they have good clean patterning so that when we apply load that will be stable and we can progress forward? Progression is driven really by the athlete and like I said that's you know that's something that's an ongoing you know an ongoing thing. If an athlete's not progressing we may repeat, repeat a training block with modifications, just like a, a version one and one B. Um, fundamentals, everything's rooted in fundamentals. You know, good training is good training. Do these kids move well? Do they understand the temporal aspects of the exercises that you're giving them? Um, is there an athletic component to it? And that's where we get to relevance. Is you know, like I said, it's it shouldn't be brain surgery. Is is what your athletes doing in the weight room and in their training environment? When you look at it, when your coach comes in and watches it. Do they see the relevance? Do the athletes see the relevance to the game? So we talk about that a lot in the weight room. I mean, I will draw out benefits of the Olympic movements um, to our athletes. I think there's some really subtle underlying ones that people don't really talk about much. And you know, but I'll point those out, and it kind of helps our athletes buy into really paying attention to the finer technical details of some of the things we give them. Fantastic. Okay, so moving on then into the athlete and coach education communication. I think um, you know Metrofit gives you a, a certain um, a certain insight here when yes. when uh, when communicating with with athletes and and you know uh, a couple of webinars ago we had Brian Clark from Nobleville. He spoke about um, you know Metrofit and monitoring giving quiet athletes a voice, um, yes. guys or girls who wouldn't normally come and come and talk to the coach. Uh, the coach can can see the data and 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 use that to go speak to the athlete, um, yeah. or they can use the communication module within the, within the, the the technology itself. Um, how, how is that working for you? Well, brilliantly. Uh, to me, it's the best. It's the best thing we get out of this. Is really what it does is it allows me to have relevant conversation. So I, again, all of us will ask the general question. A kid walks through. Hey, how are you feeling? How are you feeling today? It's sort of irrelevant. It's relevant, but it's not very accurate. You know what I mean? What I do is I require our, ath our athletes to um, log their Metrofit, um, hopefully a couple hours before, usually mid-morning or so, after they've woke up a little bit. Um, I, I have them log their Metrofit data. At that time, I'm able to look at it and see what they're experiencing that day. So when that athlete walks in the building, I can look at it and I said, and say, Jason, I see you're a little tired today. You didn't sleep well. How are you feeling now? Well, I took a nap. I feel good. I'm fine now. Great. Problem solved. If it's an ongoing issue, I can see that. I'm literally, I, I, if, it, if there's something I suspect is an ongoing issue, I'll look at the data for maybe three days. You know what I mean? Before I present to them, I don't act like every day. You know what I mean? So everything's in context. But now you have an in-context conversation with your athlete. So I may see a behavior over three days and go, okay, listen, this is I think this is an issue here. You know what I mean? You say you're tired, you say you don't you can't pay attention in class, you're having a tr you're having trouble finishing practices, blah 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 blah. 
okay, here's something we really need to kind of lock into. So much, you know, much like the other coaches experienced at Noblesville, you know, like I said, it, it allows you to have relevant conversation. You know what I mean? I'm not waste. I'm not. I'm not questioning them when they come in. I'm really addressing the needs of the addressing the specific needs of the athlete. And I think from a coaching perspective, when you really start to dial in this process, that's exactly what you're doing. You're meeting the needs of the athlete. You're understanding what they're experiencing. You're making modifications, and you're guiding them through this. So the education, the experience. Again, now I'm educating to a specific point. I use the example of, you know, do I give a, a sleep a sleep seminar to, you know, 18 of my players when four of them don't sleep well? I would much rather pull those four out, and I know they have a, a deficiency, and sit and spend the time with them and really dig into the in, into the issue. Um, like I said, I think you have there's always limitations on the contact time you have. It has to be meaningful. And if you have contact, the more meaningful contact you have, the more the athlete, I think, perceives you as being there to solve problems and help sure. guide this process. So, like I said, they'll buy in easier, obviously, then. What's that? They, they'll buy into this a lot easier when, when they see the, the positive outcomes. It, and, of course, part of the education process then as well is, is instilling uh, better habits in them, which makes them better, at, better athletes, better performers. Absolutely. But it's interesting. So, you know, again, when, it, when an athlete becomes uh, overtrained, you know what I mean, they, 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 they're, you know, their mood state is gone, their energy level is not good, what you see is that it's their habits drop off. And so, like I said, they don't practice as well. They're, you know, they're, they're, um, you know, the precision of what they do, is, it, it suffers. Um, what I find is when athletes are really struggling, they also, they, we may also have some issues with um, um, with their logging, you know what I mean, their participation. So it's kind of like, you know, you get frustrated and they just kind of give up the ghost a bit. And so it's, you know, sometimes I see it as, hey, I, got, I had to call this guy twice or text him twice to remind him to log. You know, what yeah. the hell is going on? You know, that's a change of behavior. And so if I've got a guy who's logged brilliantly for six weeks straight, all of a sudden, we're in the season. It initially, he's reporting some fatigue and some, you know, some mood, you know, fluctuations and things like that. And then I start to get, you know, kind of a lack of participation. I go, whoa, wait a second, something's wrong here. Something has changed. And so, again, I I, I look at non-compliance as a positive thing, really. So it's telling me the athlete's impaired. Something's going on here. It's not his normal behavior. He's not taking care of things the way he used to. I mean, and again, you can now sit down and have a conversation. It could be that he has family issues. It could be that he has girlfriend issues. It could be that, who knows, he got in a fight with his roommate. I mean, it can be anything. But, you know, this, this connects you to your athletes in a way that is really, truly remarkable. It's something that, in terms of if you're a coach out there, the bang for your buck. How much have I invested and what is my pay? What's the payback out of it is extremely high. So yeah, and it, as you said, it's making those conversations much more meaningful, but and, and also much more focused because yep. you have that set of data to, to, to guide you. Yes. So again, leads us nicely into then em embracing technology and, and how does it help? So let's if you could give us just an overview of the, of the different technologies that you use. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I, we kind of covered, you know, the, the recovery modalities and things we'll use. I'll use heart rate monitors. I've kind of played with, um, like, Catapult and um, Stat Sports, the Viper units, um, you know, looking at accelerometer data um, and that type of thing. And again, every I've, I've talked to a lot of people. I think that is our future. I just don't think that our... I think the data we're collecting is just that. It's data collection. I don't think we're understanding what the numbers mean. If you speak to practitioners, you can't get a clean answer, at least not in the sport. a lot of the sports in the U.S. Um, when I talk, speak to you know, soccer people and that nature, I think they feel a little more comfortable, like I said, with some of the time and distance metrics they're getting out of it, which makes sense to me. Um, again, we have more difficulty tracking that indoors. Um, but like I said, I mean, it, it, it kind of depends on the sport. So I truly believe that those kind of things are, you know, embedded technologies into garments are going to be, are the future, certainly. 
um, but there's still, you know, the front edge of that is still a developing technology. I use heart rate monitors. Um, actually, had really good conversations with two very smart Australians. Um, uh, one is the head of strength and conditioning at the Australian Institute of Sport. The other is a, a researcher at Edith Cowan University. Um, and I really rely on them because they they're seeing a lot of this is coming out of Australia, and you know, their you know their perception is that this that we don't quite know what it means yet. A lot of these okay. metrics means um, the heart rate data does give me some internal loading, um, you know, data how the athletes responding, how big a load that really presented them. So I do like the heart rate monitors. Um, so like I said, we'll use we'll use that. Um, I use force plates. I calculate RSI, reactive strength index, as a as a measure of um, neuromuscular readiness, and I like that a lot. I like that quite a bit. So, uh, like I said, I got that from Rob Newton, who's the, the Aussie friend of mine, who's at Edith Cowan. Um, so, if you're interested in that, look up Rob Newton, and and, and he's got a lot of good material. Um, so, I do that on an ongoing basis. Um, we use the gym aware. So I'm looking at bar velocities. I can do some vertical jump, you know, squat jump testing to see, you know, fluctuations in outputs. Um, I can track progress. So, like I said, I I try to track, you know, multiple points and try to give me a better picture, give me a better picture of that. Um, like I said, what I do is kind of try to make it somewhat complete. So that's kind of okay. where I'm at at this point. So we're almost out of time. Um, I've just looked at the clock. It's nearly. It, 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 we've nearly got our hour up. So I want to. I want to finish off with with this with this last uh, question. For any for any coaches that are out there uh, listening in and are, are who who are listening to this in the future, that are considering um, using Metrifit uh, as as a piece of uh, of monitoring technology, what would you say to them? Well, I think it's a necessity. Honestly, is monitoring of this kind is an absolute necessity. So, if you think about it, what something like Metrofit represents is a hub. It's a hub. It's a way to collect your data, to process your data, to store your data, to use, to compare it to past numbers, to monitor improvements, changes in the in the athlete. If you, in my opinion, again, it's something that is you get so much benefit from it. In terms of communication, you name it, uh, your decisions uh, in the weight room, on the court, wherever the case may be. Um, again, to me, it's my it's my hub. It's what I work through. It's kind of my central you know central station. So, you know, to me, it's brilliant. And then I see on the thing you say the future. To me, the future is the integration of information. You know what I mean? So we're collecting new data points. We're looking at new technologies. What does that data mean? You know, again, as we collect data, as we collect information, what we have to do is have a have a means of collecting it, analyzing it, helping us make better decisions, um, create better outcomes for our athletes. So to me, the future is. I mean, again, new technologies they'll always be there. Is how do we integrate those technologies? How do we do it to how do we use this stuff to complete the picture and give us accurate accurate information that we can use to drive our decisions? Okay. Eric, thank you very much. Um, so that's where we have to end, unfortunately. I've, I've really, really enjoyed uh, speaking with you, Eric. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, and thanks to everybody else uh, who, who's been listening in. Um, an absolute pleasure, Eric. Uh, so pleasure. best to look for best best to look for for, for the next seasons and uh, many more successes to come. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Take care.